Okay. This meeting is being recorded. And Cheryl, don't forget to mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Welcome to our uh, last uh, Spartanburg County Public Library's genealogy series for the 21-22 season. Uh, we will return in October on the first Monday night of each month um, for a new series. I haven't gotten those quite planned, so if you have suggestions, feel free to email those to the um, email address uh, provided at the end of the presentation. My name is Charity Rouse. I'm the Director of Local History for the Spartanburg County Public Library System, and it is my pleasure to present this series um, for our patrons and for those around the country who are interested in the topics. Um, there is a handout link in the um, chat. So if you find the little thought bubble in your Zoom controls and um, click that, you should be able to see the um, chat. Uh, my colleague Cheryl is on the Landrum Library account, uh, one of our branches accounts, and um, she will be happy to help um, uh, Cheryl, can you troubleshoot with Elizabeth, please? Um, and she will be happy to help uh, as best we can to get this. We are recording this to be posted on the library's YouTube channel in the genealogy playlist. It usually takes us uh, three or four days to get it up, depending on schedules. And um, we're dependent on someone in a different department to do the posting to YouTube. So sometimes it takes a little bit. We appreciate your patience. Um, do look at the Spartanburg County Public Library calendar on our website at spartanburglibraries.org. Um, you can click um, local history and genealogy and uh, it should filter those. Uh, we do have some in-person programs about the 1950 census and some other topics coming up. We'll have a series in Landrum um, coming up in August, September and October. And so do keep an eye out for the in-person. We will continue the first Monday night presentations online or, and or hybrid um, starting in October. First Monday night in September obviously is um, uh, Labor Day, that. And um, so can't do it if the library is closed. So tonight, um, We're going to be talking about DNA. And Elizabeth, I see your message that you are still muted and I don't know what to- I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm okay, on awesome, it. thanks. Um, so we're going to go over some basics of DNA for genealogists. Um, it's not meant to be an in-depth. Um, if you have specific questions, please hold them to the end. We will type them in the chat and um, hopefully have some discussion at the end. This is primarily going to be about autosomal DNA. Um, I'll talk just briefly about the other types of DNA and tests and what you can expect from testing. However, the first thing I always have to do for DNA is a disclaimer and a warning. It is likely that DNA testing will allow some family secrets out into the light of day. Whether they're your secret or someone else's secret, DNA testing is revealing a lot of family history that was swept under the rug in whatever generation. If you are afraid of finding out about unknown to you adoptions, black sheep of the family and other surprises, then just don't test. It doesn't mean that those won't come out because other people may have tested, but it does mean that you're not the one spilling the beans. Um, now, on the other hand, there are people who want to find out about the black sheep, the adoptions, what happened to these family members. 
I do ask that as you find results, as you do the DNA testing, default to being kind and default to thinking through how living family members may feel about these things being revealed and maybe go gently. Um, don't go confronting people and getting in their face um, simply because you have an idea of what's gone on. They may be completely blindsided. Um, they may not know they were adopted, those types of things. So know that different people are going to be on different parts of the journey of finding about, out about themselves and about their DNA and um, their family relationships. And so be gentle. That's all I ask. So also a note about the privacy of living individuals. Um, in regular genealogy, this is important. In DNA, this is critical. Genealogical ethics emphasize that you do not talk about living people or show screenshots of their DNA or trees publicly. Yes, this means on social media too. Don't go on Facebook, don't go on Twitter, don't go on Instagram with it, unless you have the person's written permission to do so. You need written permission to talk about living people in a personally identifiable way. Okay. Um, just because you find that cousin who was let out for adoption by your second cousin, that person and that second cousin need to be the ones who are talking about what the situation is. You don't need to be blaring it out to everyone in the extended family before they've had a chance to grapple with it. Um, I have done my very best to redact the personally identifiable information about the living people in this program, um, even the one who I have complete permission to talk about, um, just to be consistent. And also, if I missed, if I missed whiting out, blocking out somebody's name, I do apologize. It was not intentional. I have checked these pages multiple times. Um, I will probably find one that, oh yeah, I missed that one. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, now, within the various genealogy programs and databases, you can share in information with the other researchers as you're all working through the, the information. It's not about that. It's when you go outside of those platforms onto places like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, wherever else your own blog or your own face, uh, your own um, website, that you need to make sure that you have permission of those people to talk about them in an identifiable way. Now, you can say my second cousin, but you don't wanna say my second cousin, Joe Smith. So just now it's, it's, you know, ethics. So autosomal DNA or ATDNA is the abbreviation. Um, really, what is it? It is the DNA on chromosomes one through 22. We have 23 total. Um, 23 is what they um, use to represent the XX or XY sex chromosome. It's what makes you male or female. Okay. Unmute. I am unmuted. Okay. I'm back, I think. Okay, so autosomal DNA is the DNA on chromosomes one through 22, which are the non-sex related chromosomes. The XX or XY is on chromosome 23, the sex determining chromosome. Um, this is the broad across your whole family tree, look at who you are. Um, there are some 
exceptions to the 23 chromosomes and some things that happen with some mixtures um, that are very much exceptions rather than the rules. We're going to be talking about the primary basic, no weird stuff, autosomal DNA tonight. DNA testing um, can connect you with living and recent generations of your family tree. It can be helpful within about four to six generations. And so if you have specific questions about something within those most recent generations, um, and, and six, maybe eight removes. So, you know, by third cousins, you start losing genetic cousinship. About 10% of your third cousins won't share DNA with you um, is what they have found as we have been pooling the research. Um, and this can give you some broader indications of the mix of regions of the world where your ancestors lived with ethnicities. And um, just remember that this test, the autosomal test, was released onto the consumer market around a decade ago and is still an emerging, emerging field of science. So Ancestry launched their autosomal testing in 2012. We're in 2022, that's been 10 years. Um, there was a little bit of beta before that, 23andMe, uh, Family Tree DNA launched theirs in about that same time frame. Um, so just know the science is still new, we're learning. So basically, in a perfect world, we would all inherit these exact percentages of DNA from our ancestors. So we have 100% us, which is 50% mom, 50% dad, who got 50% of each of their parents, which means we got 25% of each grandparent. And that means we got approximately 12.5% from each great grandparent. That's an ideal world. Biology is a little messier than that. It can range from, you know, 13 to 30-ish percent, 33, 35 percent from each grandparent. So it just depends on how some things work in there. It's a, there's a thing called recombination. When your DNA gets put together, it recombines and crosses over. And sometimes you get a little bit more mixture from one grandparent than the other grandparent. So there's a whole lot more science to that. That's not our topic tonight. Just wanted to let you know that there's a range. It's not the ideal world. So a really quick note about the types of DNA we're not going to talk about today. Y DNA comes down the line of blue males on the left of your screen. And um, that is a Y Y is a male only uh, part of the genetic code. Men get an X and a Y on the sex chromosome. Women get an X and an X. So men do not receive an X, any X from their paternal side of the family, only the Y. Women receive an X from their father's mother. From your mom, women receive a combination of mom's two X chromosomes and men receive a combination of mom's two X chromosomes. So it can, it can be an interesting mix. My brother and I only share about 26 cinnamorgans on the X chromosome um, because we got almost opposite X chromosomes from mom. So it's kind of fun. And so X and Y are the, the gender chromosomes. So men get it from that full left part of the tree, all that male to male to male to male to male back. X comes from your, for women, comes from your father's mother and then your mother's mother and your mother and your father your mother's paternal grandmother. So from the women in the tree, but there's a little bit more on the X that can be coming down. Um, 
Now, mtDNA, which is the far right woman to woman to woman to woman to woman to woman to woman DNA um, is passed along that extreme female line back. Um, but at the bottom of the, the chart, both I and my brother inherit mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA from that maternal line. The difference is I can pass that mitochondrial DNA on to a child. My brother cannot. So it dead ends if it's a male. Mitochondrial dead ends if it's a male, passes down the female line. But both men and women get mitochondrial. Mitochondrial and X are different. So um, so that's a very brief amount of information on that. Um, but if you have more questions about that, contact me individually and we will talk through more of that. So this is another chart to help try to convey that DNA is not completely straightforward. We think, oh, it's a scientific test and we're going to get specific straight answers. Depends on what your question is. So. Um, this chart, if our 16 great grandparents started out as just a plain color each, but really they're this jumbled mixture of all of their ancestors, every generation things combine and recombine and sometimes they jump over to the other half of the chromosome and you get 22 of these chromosomes each mixing up. So there's a lot of diversity. And my brother and I did not get the same amount of, we got the same amount of DNA from each of our parents, but we did not get the same DNA from our parents. So we match different people, um, which is a blessing because that means some of those third cousins he matches and I don't. And so being able to use multiple tests to find those connections is very helpful. So again, very rough estimation, um, but I like having some visuals. So who provides these autosomal DNA tests? Well, Ancestry DNA is the biggest provider in the market. They have 16 plus million. Actually, I think they're up to between 18 and 20 million testers now. Um, and they easily allow family tree attachment so that you can um, see where you might connect. Um, obviously, you pay for the research side of Ancestry, but it can be helpful. They do regularly update their ethnicity uh, estimates, and um, they have some tools for evaluating the DNA results. Um, some of them work with the trees, which means they're only as good as the trees. And some trees are excellent, very well researched and documented. Some trees are good and some trees are just fiction. So evaluate, put your thinking cap on, do your regular genealogy too, um, alongside your genetic genealogy. Um, and they have an optional traits test um, for health stuff. It's relatively new and I'm not sure it's gotten as much traction as they want it to. Um, 23andMe is the second largest database. It has good tools to evaluate the DNA results. And I want to say eight, 8 million users, 10 million, something like that. Um, has very good tools to evaluate the DNA results, including um, chromosome browsers and some other things. We'll, we'll look at a couple things there. Um, they do regularly update their estimates ethnicity estimates, and they do have the longest term, um, most defined health component if you're interested in testing for genetic markers for things. If you do have an actual legitimate genetic test question for 
some kind of genetic syndrome or question, um, I would recommend you talk to your doctor and you actually get a medical genetic test um, and not depend on the, the genealogy tests for actual medical guidance um, because that's not what they're made for. 23andMe tries, but it's not what it's made for. Um, Family Tree DNA is the oldest of the current companies. Um, they have lots of tools for evaluating the DNA results. Um, one caveat, they do allow law enforcement tests to be loaded into the databases. Um, US testers can opt out of this. It's not an automatic, but you can opt out. Europeans, it's an automatic opt out. Um, and the law enforcement tests are restricted to John and Jane Doe cases, murder uh, victims, and um, searches for the, the killers and um, serial rapists and those types of things. So serious crimes, not frivolous crimes. Um, they do have a decent ethnicity estimate and they do update them over time. Um, and then this Family Tree DNA is the only company to offer matching for Y DNA and MT DNA testing, and they do show your X DNA matches. It's the only company that shows those. So it's a much smaller database, but it's been around um, for a lot longer, uh, especially the Y DNA and MT DNA. My Heritage DNA it has about five million users from what I could find. Um, they have good tools for evaluating DNA results. They are stronger in Europe in the Middle East. They are headquartered in Israel. Um, they're not great at updating ethnicity estimates, and we'll look at that in a minute. And unfortunately, you have to be a full subscriber to use most of those DNA tools. Um, so it may be helpful, it may not be helpful. Living DNA is the newest um, test on the US market. Um, they are out of Great Britain, out of the UK, and um, they started with a major focus on the British Isles. They do have some tools and they have some cousin matching. Both MyHeritage and um, Living DNA, I find that they're trying to show me European matches, but everybody in my family has been in the US for in excess of 200 years. Um, so it's really outside of the um, good range of matches for living people that connect back to the people I descend from. So, you know, um, ancestry, and D ancestry DNA and 23andMe require you test directly with, those, with their company. They do not accept transfers, but the other three companies will allow uploads of either Ancestry or 23andMe results. There may be a small fee to unlock some of the tools, or you can wait for a sale and test directly with them. Just know that MyHeritage is still going to want you to pay for things, uh, even after you test directly with them. Um, so you'll see some examples of all of the above within this program. Um, so the strengths of autosomal DNA testing um, are for finding family. The health stuff, the ethnicity stuff, those are good coffee table conversations, but the real strength is finding family. You will find known or unknown relatives who have tested or uploaded with that company, and they will appear in your match list. With that company is important. <laughs> We fairly regularly have people come in and say, well, my cousin took this test, but they don't match me. And you come to find out one person tested on Ancestry, the other person tested on 23andMe, or one of the other three tests, or one of the DNA tests that doesn't even do family finding and cousin matching, just some form of ethnicity results. Um, and we have to explain to people, no, you have to both test or upload to the same company or to GEDmatch, which is the third party uh, site that will take uploads from all of the other companies. 
to, so that you can compare your results. It's still not apples to apples necessarily, but at least you can compare them. So test with the same company, upload to the same company, compare on the same platform. Um, it's a strength for confirming relationships. It's a great way to find those cousins you lost touch with once the older generation passed on. Those second and third cousins that maybe you knew as kids when you had big family reunions. And once your great grandparents passed on, you stopped having the family reunions. So this can be a, a way to reconnect. If you think that there is a chance of adoption, known or unknown, um, or that there might be a not parent expected, otherwise NPE, um, you will want to test or upload to all the various databases if possible. And I would say test with Ancestry, test with 23andMe, upload whichever one you do first to the other sites, including GEDmatch. And as they say, fish in all the ponds. You will get uh, some pretty good broad ethnicity estimates for the continent, subcontinent level. They continue to refine these. Some of the companies are better than others, and some uh, ethnicities are easier to define than others. So on Ancestry DNA, some examples from my own test and that of my mother. Um, they are the largest DNA database. I have over 100,000 matches, um, 100,782, uh, which is typical for someone with most or all lines going back to pre-revolutionary war America. Um, it is what it is. Um, my mother has 122,867 matches. Um, and of those, 12,689 are fourth cousin or closer. Um, I have only 7,529 fourth cousin or, or closer, which is basically 20 Cinemorgans up through parent, um, which is you know just under 3,500, 32 to 3,500 Cinemorgans. Um, with on mine, distant matches are 93,253, which is six to 20 shared Cinemorgans. Um, I'm not necessarily gonna make it all the way down to those distant matches. I, I probably haven't gotten through my top 3,000 matches, quite frankly. Um, so it's just one of those situations where you work with what you have and you do the best you can with what you have. Um, they give you some tools at Ancestry to color code groups and make notes to yourself, and this can help you track your research. It can also help if you have a parent willing to test. I mean, as you see, my mother has more matches than I do. She's a generation closer to a lot of these people. Um, but also, because my mother has tested, it means I can, and my parents are not related, <laughs> That gets exciting, um, but my parents are not related. Um, so I can use some tools to sort out, okay, if you match mom, you're on the maternal side. If you don't match mom, you're on dad's side. And I'll show you why that's important in just a minute. So here's my top few DNA matches. Um, we have my mom, we have my aunt, we have uh, a first cousin once removed who's related to my father, one of his, well, his one living first cousin, um, and uh, one of my mom's first cousins. Um, as you can see, I've started doing some uh, colored dots um, and identifying what part of the family they are. Um, Ancestry continues to refine their tools and the things they offered. Before we had dots, they only had this yellow star that you could star people. So I went through and I was starring everybody who didn't match mom. So, <laughs> um, so I have a mixture of things. Um, and just so you can see, Ancestry started doing shared uh, percentages of shared DNA as well as the raw numbers. So that can help you figure things out too. So you see 
3487 is approximately 50% shared DNA, which is the expected parent to child relationship. My aunt is about 1,600 cinnamorgans, which is about 23% shared DNA, which is in that range of, you know, give or take a few percents off of 25%. Um, and then the first cousin once removed on my dad's side shares about 7%, which again is in the right range for a first cousin once removed. Um, on my mother's test, um, it shows that I'm her daughter, that same shared DNA. It shows her sister at 2430 Cinnamorgans, 43 to 50% shared. Um, one or the other of them or both had some what they call no-call regions where um, not everything lined up. And so they didn't get good um, information off of that part of the DNA, but they're within the range and they match people on both sides. So they're, they're full sisters. Um, the next three are all first cousins to my mother. Um, in fact, all three on the side where there are 27 who made it to adulthood. Um, and so you see a little bit of a range. Okay, this one has 1,000 cinnamorgans, so 15%. This one has 957, so that's 14%. Now, this one, Ancestry is saying, well, it's first cousin to second cousin. We don't really know. And it's just under 900 cinnamorgans. It's 13% shared DNA. However, when you click in on that 889 cinnamorgans, 13% shared DNA, it gives you this information about the match. And so my mother and DM, they estimate 99% of the time, this is a first cousin, great grandparent, great grandchild, or um, grand aunt, grand uncle, grand niece, grand nephew relationship. It's pretty solid, first cousin, not a first cousin once removed or a second cousin. It's a first cousin. So, I'm not sure what's giving them the less confidence on that versus the other two first cousins. Um, but you work with the DNA and you work with your paper trail and you're eventually, hopefully able to connect the dots. Some weaknesses of autosomal DNA testing for finding family. Um, smaller families will have fewer matches. There aren't enough people to test. Only 11 of my top 100 matches on Ancestry are from my dad's side of the family. I was absolutely delighted when his first cousin showed up just about two months ago because that first cousin is, and he has one child and another first cousin still has one living child who has not tested or does it match me if they've tested, but I don't think they've tested. And I think that cousin has two children. So my brother and I are largely it. And that's on the side of the family where my father has a lot of relatives, relatively speaking. Um, on the other side, my father was an only grandchild. So there's nobody living to test until you get to my father's second cousins. So just know you may have a lot from one side of the family and it looks like nobody's there from your other side of the family. And don't assume it's not the parent expected unless you're seeing a lot of matches that don't line up with the other parent, especially if you're fortunate enough to have um, a, one parent to, able to be tested. Um, but you have to think about the various possibilities, but please don't jump to conclusions. Once you get beyond parent, child, and full sibling relationships, there are many possibilities of how you can connect with a match. So explore all the options. Um, one weakness is that none of these um, testing companies, none of their 
programs and algorithms handle multiple relationships very well. Multiple relationships, meaning pedigree collapse, where you share the same grandparents of whatever the degree is um, on different lines or multiple times, or endogamy, which is where a particular community marries within that community for generations upon generations. So pedigree collapse is on my line, I have one set of, let's see, third great grandparents and fourth great grandparents who are the same people. They're just on two lines of my mother's family. So, or you have first cousins marrying first cousins or brother, a brother and sister marrying a brother and sister. You have same ancestors a couple of different times in the tree. Endogamy is something that you see in populations like uh, European royalty, like um, Mennonite, Jewish, Amish communities that have religious uh, bases to stay within their community. Um, geographic and language groups such as French Canadians. Um, sometimes you see this in um, areas in the mountains or remote areas where there's just not a lot of choice and you do end up marrying your second cousins or your fourth cousins and it just keeps happening repeatedly. So that is endogamy. That is a cluster of joint relationships back in time. So none of the, the companies in their trees or their DNA tests handle that particularly well. If you've got questions about those affecting your research, I can point you to some people who know a lot more about that than I do. Um, and then the family, finding family and DNA testing works best when you can attach a verified tree to the results. Um, 23andMe doesn't allow you to, they try to create a tree for you, which is kind of interesting. And I didn't get a screenshot of that um, because it's a little unwieldy for a screenshot. Um, but some of the other companies, Family Tree DNA and Ancestry, uh, MyHeritage and Now Living DNA allow you to attach a tree and it helps. So just as an example of some of these options, um, these are, uh, this is my dad's first cousin um, on the left, MT. And so it says 89% chance that he is my first cousin once removed, my half first cousin. So only sharing one of a parent, one parent and not an entire parent couple or great, great grandchild or parent. Um, there's a 6% chance of second cousin, first cousin, twice removed, et cetera. So 89% chance is where we are with the first cousin once removed. And these are numbers that have been crowdsourced over the past decade as people have confirmed relationships and amounts of cinnamorgans. Um, on the right, there is um, MS, who is a my father's second cousin once removed. Um, and um, that 50% chance is a second cousin once removed or a half second cousin, a first cousin three times removed uh, or a half first cousin sec twice removed. 31% is a second cousin, first cousin twice removed. So there are, again, multiple options for that. And you should find that your match fits into one of these unless there is a double relationship, in which case that can bump them up a category um, because you're getting a double dose of DNA. It doesn't always double it, but you often, if you've got multiple relationships, you will match it higher than expected levels. Um, on, and those are charts that if you click the, how do, how are you estimating this? Um, click all the hyperlinks on Ancestry. It'll tell you all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but there's another uh, third party um, 
option, which is dnapainter.com. And um, they have put together the shared Cinnamorgan project, which is crowdsourced from genealogists um, confirming their relationships. And it is updated over time. This is the latest update. Um, it was updating quite often in the first few years that it was up and then it's kind of settled out because we've we've gotten a, a good core of information into it so that it's fairly stable. One of the fun things about this though is in the little box um, on the filter you can put the Cinemorgans. If you only have a percentage from family tree or from 23andMe, you can click the or enter percent green little link there and enter the percent number and hit reset and it'll show you, it'll highlight all the options that that relationship number can be. And so it's just a really helpful way to visualize this. DNA Painter has other tools. Um, I'm not getting into those today. That's, you know, intermediate to advanced stuff. But if you want to play around with it, it's an option to play around with. And a, a number of things are free on the site, including the Shared Cinemorgan Project. Some other things you do need to subscribe um, because uh, Johnny has to pay his bills. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a great tool to know about. 23andMe, when you go in there and you say, okay, show me my, share, my relatives, uh, my, one of the things about 23andMe is it shows far fewer of your relatives. And I didn't check what my 1509 relative was and see what the shared Cinemorgan was, but I would say it's significantly higher than the eight Cinemorgans that Ancestry cuts off at. Um, because basically, unless you have connected with that cousin at the bottom of the list, when a new cousin comes into the list, it'll push somebody off the bottom. So just be aware of that. Um, most of us are not looking at those really small matches um, simply because they are just as likely to not be valid matches at under 10 Cinemorgans than they are valid matches. Um, anyway. Uh, 23andMe has some different uh, ways to search and sort their information. They do tell you how many, um, the percentage of DNA you share, the segment, number of segments, whether you're connected, that's just something on theirs that you can see a little bit more of their information and their ethnicity um, versus if you haven't connected. Um, and these are just my top matches. My mom um, tested on 23andMe for me as well. Um, this is a first cousin on her dad, on mom's dad's side. Um, this is my first cousin's child. So remember on first cousins, the removed can go up a generation or down a generation. And for genetic DNA, genetic uh, genealogy, if it's a match that's up a generation, it's going to be a higher match probably on the higher end of that range of a first cousin once removed. And if it is a generation lower, then it's going to be probably a little less DNA shared. Um, and as you see here, the, this is my, my match to these cousins on the, my mother's first cousin is a 6.97% DNA shared. My first cousin's child is only 4.86% percent DNA shared, which is what you would expect. Um, that's another of my mother's first cousins who shares a little bit less just because of the randomness. Um, another one of my first cousin's kids, and then one of my second cousins. So just know that there are going to be variations between the companies because they have test different parts of the chromosome and they test um, against different populations, reference populations. Um, this is, uh, MF is the MS from Ancestry. Um, one's a maiden initial, one's a married initial. Um, 
23andMe will tell you when you click in, oh, I matched this person. They will tell you their birth year if they're sharing that information, when they've last been active, if they're sharing that information, their current location, if they put one in. Um, I'm not sure I have a current location in because my current location does not reflect anywhere that my ancestors actually lived on either side of the family. Um, it predicts your genetic relationship. I have edited this one. I know exactly what that relationship is. Um, and then as you scroll on down, you can add them to the tree that 23andMe puts together. And as you get new matches, it will rearrange things. Um, the family background, I put in a lot of ancestor birthplaces and surnames. Um, the match put in fewer, but we match on that Eastern Shore of Virginia side of the family, which is all of my father's mother's lines for generations. You can compare your ancestry if you are connected and if they have said they will share. Um, we're both pretty much 100% European. Um, if you have tested um, or if you are female or male, 23andMe will give you a very high level maternal haplo haplogroup. Paternal haplogroup is only available if you are male and have a Y chromosome. Occasionally, someone has said that because their father tested, um, a paternal haplogroup will show up on one of the companies for a female. Um, I, don't know if a brother would do that or not. Um, 23andMe does a random Neanderthal ancestry estimate. I'm not sure what other than grins and giggles that does. And then at the very bottom, it says you have relatives in common. Um, so when I click find relatives in common, we get a lovely chart here. And one of the best things about matching with someone on both 23andMe and Ancestry is I can start telling, because Ancestry does not have a chromosome browser. It does not tell you anything other than, hey, you share matches. If you have a parent test, hey, they're on the mother's side or both sides or not. Um, but I have cases where people on my mother's mom's side of the family are matching people on my mom's dad's side of the family. And it got really confusing until I realized that they matched each other in a completely different way than how I match them. So again, don't automatically jump to, oh no, my parents are related. My parents aren't related. My mom's parents are not related. It's just because of the mountain community and the valley community and the small choices in, in, in people to marry, um, sometimes there people from the extended family marry other people from the extended family and it gets interesting on the tree. Um, 23andMe tells you whether there is DNA overlap. So this first one, AC is a third cousin to me, a very distant cousin to M, and we do not overlap our DNA. But AB, the second person on the list, is a third cousin to me and a third cousin to M, and I know exactly where that third cousin fits in, and I now have both of these people in the tree, and we do share DNA which is very good to know. Um, fortunately, I think both of, the, both of them are on a couple of the other uh, testing platforms. So it's always good to be able to, to cross-reference between the platforms. Um, so 23andMe does have a chromosome browser. Um, the top match is MF. The next match is that AC. And you see that we don't have the darker orange and the maroon, um, the purpley, matching at any point on these first six chromosomes. Um, at the same time, we don't match. 
I match each of them and they distantly match each other, but it does not mean it's a close relationship. Um, SL is my mother's first cousin. AG is my cousin's daughter. And then my mom is the green. And you see, I've got green, 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 green. And I did a bad job at cropping the screenshot. At the very beginning of chromosome six, there is a little bit of missing, not colored chromosome. And it's just one of those areas where there is a no call. Uh, one or the other of us didn't have full test results on that chunk. So they just didn't put anything in there. So it's why we're at 48% instead of 50%, you know it's close enough. Um, and also note on chromosome four, um, we're seeing that purple overlapping with the green. Now remember, you get two chromosomes. You get one from dad and one from mom. The purple is matching me on dad's chromosome that I inherited, and the green is mom's chromosome that I inherited. I'm very confident on that I match mom. <laughs> So it helps me start if I wanted to um, go to DNA Painter and paint in my DNA to try to start filling in potential what dad's DNA might have looked like, then um, this gives me someone to work with on that. I don't have enough close matches to make it actually work. I've tried, um, but it was a fun try. So attaching a tree to your results, you don't have to attach a full tree. You don't have to use your full name. Uh, women, we do recommend that you use your maiden name, not your married name. Although if you use your married name, it can be a clue and give us more information for those people who don't have trees. Um, but at least a pedigree chart version, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is from mom's kit, yeah, on Ancestry. Um, and you'll see that this top one has a private unlinked tree. Well, it doesn't do any good because it's not linked to the DNA results and it's not uh, public. And so it's not particularly helpful. Now, I know who this is because they had their full name, and the amount of cinnamorgans, I could place them in the tree. That's a pretty close relative for a first cousin once removed. On my test shows up as this perfect second cousin, we're good. Down here at the bottom, EW um, has no trees at all. Probably tested for ethnicity only or tested and found out a surprise and backed off. Um, didn't know that they could put a tree together, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know who this is. It's on my mom's side of the family, which means there are a bajillion cousins. So I haven't gotten that far. They're matching a little high for what is known. So, you know, there could be something going on there. I just don't know. Uh, the middle one, CH has an unlinked tree. I went to that tree. Now, unlinked trees, it could be that they did a tree for their spouse or someone else or a friend, or, you know, I have a bajillion trees. I have like 35 trees. Um, only a couple of them are mine. So I have trees for a couple of friends. I have trees for uh, some puzzles that I was working out for, uh, various people. So just know an unlinked tree needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt. But I looked at that unlinked tree, looked at the name and went, wait, and did some comparison with some other resources, uh, dar.org. That's the person who helped us shortcut into DAR, uh, had just put in a supplemental application not too long before we applied and it wasn't fully in the system. So we didn't know she had done that. And she is my mother's second cousin on two separate, completely unrelated lines. So she's matching high, but we know why she's matching high. 
Um, HS is textbook, public linked tree, 700 people, common ancestor shows up and right falls right into the actual, hey, this is where the relationship is. So solid second cousin to my mother. Um, and then this last one, BK, has a publicly linked tree of 539 people. There is no connection. And oh, shoot, shared matches are on both sides of my mother's family. I can't place this person. The public tree doesn't match any of the surnames that I have in my family tree and my main research tree is 3000 plus people in it. So I don't know, somebody found a little bit of a surprise or maybe it's only a surprise to the rest of us and they knew, I don't know. So more research is required. Um, but if you don't have a linked tree of some sort, you will not get tree hints. You will not get through lines, which I'm not going to talk about specifically here, but it's another thing that Ancestry does. It says, hey, your DNA match and people who have trees that have these same people in them have this as a potential relationship. Now, remember, family trees on Ancestry, some of them are excellent with good sources. Most of them are good, well-intended, decently sourced, and some of them are completely made up and everything between those three. Um, and so just be aware you might be building something on very shaky foundation if you choose common knowledge or um, unsourced tree to look at. So. When I say a pedigree tree, I mean, um, this is mine. It's what I knew in 2016 when I did my DNA results and attached my tree to them. It is my direct ancestors. Does not include their siblings. Does not include children of their siblings. It just includes the direct ancestors. Um, this is an older screenshot because ancestry no longer allows you to change your background color. Um, and so um, I've put all known maiden names for the women, maiden surnames for the women. Um, my much larger research tree is private and unsearchable because I do a lot of presentations. I have adoptees and others on my tree who have not given me permission to talk about them. So it's easier to have it private so I don't have to redact so much information about living people. Um, I have some of my random trees are trees that I have created so that I have trees I can talk about. But this has just direct ancestors. Um, but it gives surnames. It gives my direct surnames. And if that person has those same surnames from a sibling of my ancestor, we can start putting the pieces together. It gives and at least a, a clue for other researchers. So ethnicity estimates. Um, <laughs> ethnicity estimates will change over time as more research is done. They are estimates. Every time somebody, one of the companies changes their ethnicity estimate, uh, there's this big brouhaha all over all of the genealogy Facebook pages and listservs and people come into the library and they're like, they changed. I don't have my Spanish. It's now Iberian or whatever. My Scottish is now Irish. My Irish is now Scottish. Okay. We're, we're only talking Virginia to West Virginia there, you know? <laughs> It's not that big of a difference. There are differences, but you know, okay. These estimates are trying to place your ancestors somewhere between 500 and 1200 years ago. So before the general genealogical time frame where we have paper trails. 
they are based on a reference panel of testers where the tester reports that their great grandparents of whatever generations are all in one locality. Tester reported living testers. Somebody might not know that there was an oops in their family tree. Someone might have been told they were always there and then that next generation back, whether it was fifth generation, sixth generation, whatever, came from somewhere else. And maybe a somewhere else that was very far away. We don't know. Each company uses a different reference panel for their test evaluations. So each company is going to be at least a little bit different. Um, the ethnicity estimates do not always address the question of ethnic group who share a language, customs, traditions, food, et cetera, but not always geographical boundaries versus a country which shares, people within a country share a geographic boundary, but they people may or may not share a language, custom, religion, et cetera. So there's always the, the tension between those two uh, groups. Geographical boundaries change significantly over time. Look at current Europe, it's still changing. So just because someone lived in Germany does not mean that Germany had the same footprint that it currently has, because I can assure you it did not have that footprint. And everyone living in Germany may not be of the same ethnic or language group. There are going to be dialects. There are going to be people who speak French in the Alsace, uh, where it borders France, Polish, Austrian, whatever. There are going to be differences within that population. It's not monolithic. Not everyone in the United States is the same. Not everyone in Europe is the same. Not everyone in Virginia is the same. Not everyone in Germany is the same. So these estimates do the best they can with a population that moved around considerably over time. Um, most companies have white papers which explain at least in part their methodology for analyzing their ethnicity and other um, analyze other science backing up what they're putting out there. Look for the white paper. If you can't find it, uh, contact customer support and ask for them to email you the link and they will. Um, so Ancestry Ethnicity just updated in April, 2022. You can probably still hear the but, 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 but going on. Um, this is my new ethnicity. Um, isn't it pretty with the little map? I'm now supposedly 48% Scotland, 25% uh, England and Northwestern Europe, 13% Welsh, 10% uh, Germanic Europe, 3% Norway, and 1% Finland. All of my Irish went away into Scotland, which is kind of interesting. Ulster Plantation, a bunch of Scots Presbyterians got moved to Northern Ireland and then ended up coming over to the United States. So could be. Um, some countries such as Finland tend to have a much more um, insular population as opposed to Norway and some others in the UK in particular where they intermingled genetically with other groups. Um, so just something to play with. If you click on the little right arrow beside the percentage, you will get much more information about that um, ethnicity, the history of that region, and the range. So just because it says 48%, I think the range is something like 20 to 60% Scottish. So, you know, Welsh is zero to 26%. They estimate 13. So, you know, it's a it's an educated guess. Um, Ancestry did this um, you and here's what you inherited from parent one and parent two. They don't tell you who is parent one, who is parent two, because they can't. And even if parent one of the parents is tested, um, yeah. 
all of my Scandinavian got split into two batches uh, and only one parent has that, which is my mom. So, you know, um, but I clicked in the overview, clicked to see more detailed. You can play with the little toggles and turn Scotland on and off and things like that to see where the various countries show up. And then you can scroll down and get a detailed comparison. Now they put the disclaimer inheritance random ethnicities may be passed down unevenly or not at all. Just as a reminder, they're, they're working on the science and quite frankly, DNA is pretty advanced science. Um, and they call this their side view technology. So, um, but it, you get some ranges as to where you got which thing. Now, one thing that they do a pretty good job with are your DNA communities. And um, they give you two. So we, I have two genetic communities, Central Appalachia Settlers, 1700 to 1950, and then um, Lower Midwestern Virginia Settlers, um, again, 1700 to 1950. Not a surprise, um, while I had one set of third great grandparents move west. He died in Kentucky. She died in Missouri. Um, I had siblings of various generations move west across where you see that orange block, and some moved further. Um, my direct line, other than that one set of third great grandparents, pretty much stayed put in Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. And again, my mother's large family is overrunning everybody else. My, my father's family on the Eastern shore of Virginia and the Delmarva Peninsula and in South Carolina is just getting a little shoved out of this because there aren't enough of them to impact this because they only give you two genetic communities. But these are people whose genetic makeup is similar to yours. Please note that a geographic area can have multiple DNA communities. You can have mine, you can have one that is more German Hessian descendants, one that is African American descendants, one that is Pennsylvania Dutch descendants, but they can all be in the same geographic area. So it's just looking at people who match you DNA wise, they may or may not be genetic relatives, but they are people who moved and, and from the same places in Europe to the same places in the Eastern part of the US and then as they move across the country. So ethnicity comparison between the companies, this is my last section, we are almost done. Um, and so this is the most recent updates uh, from all five of the companies. We just saw the Ancestry one. So 23andMe, um, their most recent update was in 2021, and it says I'm 99.9% .9 European. The largest percentage of that 76.1 is British and Irish, 17.5% French and German, uh, just under 2% Scandinavian, a little bit of Finnish, broadly Northwestern European that they can't definitively categorize is 3.8%, and then 0.1% uh, unassigned. So, you know, not big surprises there. And French and German, British Isles, there was a lot of movement back and forth between those regions. I mean, what was it, 1066 in Charlemagne? Um, Robert the Bruce, you know, various, various movements of royalty and their friends, associates, and neighbors across that part of Europe. Family tree DNA, they're my origin version three. Um, I think I have results from one, two, and three. They haven't changed substantially, but 100% European. Um, Western Europe, England, Wales, Scotland, 98%. Uh, Southern Europe, they say uh, somewhat under 2% Greece and Balkans. Uh, potential trace of Ashkenazi Jewish and a potential trace of Arabia. Um, Anything under 3% is a little bit potential to be noise or suspect. Um, just random where things are meeting up and where they're reading things on the edges. 
it could be true that I have some Jewish, but eh, that little, it's going to be really hard to try to figure that out. My heritage is the outlier. Um, now, what is that? 86.1 English Irish percent English Irish, Scottish, and Welsh matches up. It's the other 15%, 14% that's a little bit interesting. Um, we have 2.3% Iberian, which could be. My mother has a little bit of Iberian, according to Ancestry, although that has gone down from about 10% to about 3%, I think. Um, a little bit of Ashkenazi Jewish, a little bit of Italian, and then they're saying 7.6% North African. And the real puzzling one is the almost a percent of Nigerian. Now, honestly, I think that their reference panel has some people in it who had unknown early colonial European ancestry, and that has confused the results. That's my theory. I am not a trained geneticist. But they're the only company out of the five that has any of that estimate um, other than the Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, so, you know, I'm taking that one with a huge grain of salt. Now they do have genetic groups, which like Ancestry's DNA communities can be very helpful. And their groups put me in Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, and West Virginia, and the Southern USA. Um, which again, if I had gotten New York, I would have been really surprised, but those could be helpful if I could actually do anything with them, which I can't because I don't have a full subscription to my heritage because we all have budgets. So uh, living DNA, maybe the one you haven't seen results for, as I said, they, they are out of uh, Great Britain. And um, they started primarily with subdividing Great Britain and Ireland, 97.4%. And they give a breakdown of, hey, you've got 10% Southeast England, 19.6 Cumbria. I'll take that. That's a beautiful part of England. Um, Cornwall, Devon, Northern Ireland, Southwest Scotland, you know. So we'll see. Um, and then some, some, Northwest Germanic, which is that German, French, et cetera. So, you know, it's an estimate. So other than my heritage, they all kind of say, and even my heritage says that 85% UK. So, you know, the trace stuff, we'll see. Um, some words of wisdom for contacting matches. Uh, do send the initial message through the testing company system. Most of the testing company systems get the message to you. 23andMe is pretty good about it. Um, Ancestries is pretty awful, but give it a chance first. I would include your email address in your message. Um, a couple of them, I think MyHeritage, you can message through maybe, or you ha may have to have a... a subscription there. Um, living DNA and family tree DNA, I know, um, it. you put an email in. And so include your email, preferred genealogy email address in your message. Um, do you mention what kit you match, at what distance? If you think you know a line, surname, or location that might be in common, you could mention that. But definitely mention your own kit name and number and which testing company? Because I can't tell you how many times I've had, we match at 10 Cinemorgans. How do we connect? I don't know what company. I don't know what kit. I don't know anything. And, and it's too low a uh, connection for anything but grasping at straws. Um, have a great subject line. Keep it light and friendly. Don't write five pages, maybe a paragraph and a half or, you know, a short, 
hi, we match on Ancestry. My username is whatever. Here's what I, here's how we match. And I match so-and-so, whatever, whatever, whatever. I hope we can find how we connect. Sincerely, your cousin, Charity. You know, keep it light, keep it friendly, keep it short, professional, not. We match at 300 Cinemorgans. Tell me how, which I've gotten. Actually, it wasn't 300 Cinnamon Morgans. It was smaller than that, but it was pretty abrupt and rude. Um, that did not get a particularly strong or helpful response from me, whereas some of the others have gotten much better responses from me. If you don't get an answer, wait a couple weeks or months before trying again. Not everybody gets into their DNA matches every day. Um, and then just remember that no matter how important some detail or matches to you and how time sensitive you think it is, 99% of our genealogy is not time sensitive. There are very few situations where something is time sensitive. Remember the person you are reaching out to has their own life, their own priorities for research, they may need time and space to come to grips with what has come to light due to their DNA test or what they have found. They may not want to engage. They may be dealing with an illness in the family or a new baby or a new job or a move or any number of things that, and, and they may have taken it for ethnicity and they're not that interested but they might check back in once they hear, oh, there's been an update and oh, look, I have a message. Um, don't bombard them every day for weeks because it looks, it makes you look like a stalker. Um, I don't recommend stalking someone on Facebook and contacting them through Facebook before you have tried to contact them through the, um, uh, platform where you match. Um, if it's been some time since it, you know, if you can see, oh, they haven't signed on in three years, maybe you look at the Facebook, maybe you check, you know, it may, testing's been going on for 10 years. It is highly likely that many of the people you match have obituaries out there. So Google them if they have an actual name versus uh, a username. Um, so, do your genealogy, build their tree for the match, see what you can find out. Um, Ancestry's mess messages, messaging system is notoriously bad. I get it. Do be patient. Um, I manage a variety of kits on multiple testing platforms. So knowing which kit you're talking about can be really helpful because I don't like to respond back to someone until I have verified what they have told me. And if you don't tell me which of five testing platforms you match me on, if you don't tell me which kit you match me on, I, ma I manage kits for six people, um, including myself, five others beyond myself, one of whom is not even related to me. So, it's just one of those situations where if you don't give me anything to work with, you're not necessarily gonna get much of a, a response. So, um, MF or MS on the two sites, and I both descend from people in this photo taken in 1901. It's very cool. There are four generations represented in the photo. My grandmother's oldest sister is the baby held in our great grandmother's arms. Her parents and her grandfather are in the middle there. DNA has connected me to descendants of multiple of those siblings. And so that has been fun to put descendants with the ancestors. And um, you know, if you're from the Eastern shore and any of those look like people in your family pictures, let me know. So thank you so much, um, and I hope that we can uh, connect. 
I hope you have a great summer of research. And again, we'll see you online the first Monday at in October, seven o'clock. Check the library calendar closer to that time for um, information. And also do definitely uh, keep an eye on the library calendar for both in-person and online programming. Um, stuff may pop up between now and then, and um, we'll be happy to have you join us. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm sorry I ran a little bit long. Um, I think we started a little bit late with the technical issues, um, but uh, I'm gonna stop recording and then please feel free to type any questions in the chat box. So you're ready for me to stop recording? Yes, stop okay. recording.